Hi, everybody. Sorry, this is coming out a bit late, but here is a lecture where we apply what we learned about plate tectonics to a brief overview of Antarctica's geologic history. So the first half of today's class will introduce concepts such as the fossil record, different types of fossils, and how we use fossils and rocks to tell geologic time. During the second half, we will start systematically going through the history, geologically speaking, of Antarctica going from the oldest rocks on Earth, as well as the oldest rocks in Antarctica, up until right before dinosaurs show up. And next class, we will start talking about Antarctic dinosaurs. We won't talk about this, this Antarctic Pelta in this class, but we'll get there soon. And we'll talk about what happened between the extinction of dinosaurs and today. And that will lead into a discussion of Antarctic terrestrial life. So that will be the next lecture that will happen next Monday. So a couple of quick reminders. Sorry, a couple of quick reminders. The first is that lab two on oceanography and circulation is due on Friday. And remember that there is a slideshow the TAs have put together that is useful for that. And there's a little bit of information on what might be useful from lecture in regards to this lab in the review session material from Monday, April 12th. Also a week from the Sunday, um, so on also on Sunday, April 18th, the first lecture quiz is due. Again, you have 30 minutes to take that. So 11.30 PM on Sunday night is probably the very latest you'd want to be taking it, but hopefully you get it done before then. And there is a number of practice questions in the review session slides from Monday. A week after that, the first reading assignment is due. And the climate and paleontology articles that I've assigned should give you a sense of what sort of articles I'm looking for, for reading assignment number one. And as for the paleontology articles, I will actually discuss some of them in a bit more depth next class because they relate to concepts we get to next class. There's actually also two ge geology seminars happening in the next couple of days and those provide extra credit opportunities. The first of them is our department colloquium, which happens just about every Thursday at 2 p.m. Um, we have Tolulope Ologboji uh, from the University of Rochester talking about ocean sediments and how we study them. So this one is happening on Thursday, April 15th at 2 p.m. And the information for accessing it via Zoom is here. And then there is another UC Santa Cruz seminar. A grad student from MIT, Clara Morell, will be talking about how we'll be talking about the study of planetesimals, which are objects in the solar system that are larger than asteroids, but not quite planets. So that is happening on Friday, April 16th at 12 p.m. So that is a good one potentially if you can't normally make the 2 p.m. Thursday sessions because those are when most of them are. So today we'll start talking about the rock record, different types of rocks, how we figure out how old rocks are and the rules we use to do that. We'll then talk about fossils and how fossils form and what fossils tell us about ancient life and about ancient worlds. And then we will start digging no pun intended, into the geologic history of Antarctica from the earliest life and the earliest rocks until the Permian extinction, very shortly before dinosaurs appeared and an event that sets the stage for dinosaurs to appear. In fact, although a lot of this will be general, I will be highlighting events related to Antarctica throughout this. So it's a little bit of a highlights reel of the geologic history of Antarctica because a complete in-depth study of that is beyond the scope of this course, frankly. That would be a whole course in itself, as opposed to just one, one unit of it. So time as, sorry, time as we understand it today in terms of hours and days and centuries extends back a lot farther than human knowledge. We know today that the earth is billions of years old and we can put human history on the same timeline as geologic time that geologic time, which extends back to the origin of the Earth 4.6 billion years ago. We are living in that same timeline. We are living at the very, very tail end of it. If you look closely at the spiral diagram, and I like the spiral diagram because it gives you a sense of just how far back time goes, and you can see less and less of it the further you go back. And that corresponds to the fact that we know very little about time as we go farther and farther back, as we have fewer rocks and fewer fossils. And we are living at the very tail end of it. If you look closely, you can see that there's an airplane and a ship there, which shows that humans have existed at the very tail end of geologic time. 
And humans have only existed for a tiny proportion of Earth's history and of the universe's history. We've come up with intervals of time largely using fossils and the rocks that they're found in. And to a big extent, we've looked at patterns such as the appearance or disappearance of different groups of organisms like flowering plants or dinosaurs or mammals or humans. And we've defined these intervals by the fossils and rocks. It isn't the other way around. We don't find fossils and rocks and say, oh, this is a Cretaceous rock or this is a Cambrian rock. We do that now, but in fact, we've defined intervals in geologic time by the fossils we've found, not the other way around. So we begin by dividing time into eons, which in a colloquial sense, eon means ages ago. And even though we are technically in an eon, we're in the Phanerozoic eon, that eon has actually been going on since the Cambrian period, since in fact, 500 or 600 or so million years ago, most groups of modern life evolved. Before that, we have what is known as Precambrian time, in which we have several other eons that we don't know very much about, frankly, because the fossil record is quite poor. Eons are divided into eras, like the Paleozoic era, the Age of Ancient Life, or the Age of Fishes, as it's sometimes called, the Mesozoic era, or the Age of Dinosaurs, and the Cenozoic era, which we're living in. You can divide eras into periods, like for the Mesozoic era, the Triassic, Cretaceous, and uh, excuse me, Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous period, all of which have dinosaurs living in them, but have slightly different varieties of dinosaurs living in them. And if the record is good enough, we can actually divide the periods into epochs, which will be brought up more with recent geology, because the younger the rocks are, the better the fossil record is going to be, and the more detailed divisions we can make sort of like with history, actually. So we are living in one such epoch, the Holocene epoch, which began when the period of intense glaciation, the last glacial maximum in the ongoing ice age came to an end. Humans have only been around since the Pleistocene epoch for the last two epochs. So we've been around for a very, very small interval of time, all things considered. Now, I've mentioned the fact that the geologic time scale is based on rocks, and we have three basic types of rocks that you'll want to know and that make up the different rocks in the rock record. And there will also be a lab in a few weeks on rocks of Antarctica that will walk you through a little bit of introductory rock identification. So roughly, rocks can be broken down into three types. We have igneous rocks, we have sedimentary rocks, and we have metamorphic rocks. Now, igneous rocks come from magma. If you remember the rocks that were formed on the ocean floor by seafloor spreading, that is one example of an igneous rock. Um, that is actually basalt, and basalt is a rock that you get at many volcanoes, actually. You get it at Mount Erebus, and it's a type of igneous rock that cools very quickly at the surface. Another example includes granite, like this granite I actually photographed when I was doing my field research, and granite has big crystals because it actually cools very slowly underground. The rocks I was looking at have since been exposed at the surface by erosion. You also get rhyolite, which is the name for ash that you get at explosive eruptions, and obsidian or volcanic glass. And granite is actually um, granite is actually granite and rhyolite are both rocks that form the continents to a big extent. I mentioned how continental crust is made by subduction, largely at trenches at subduction zones. And this very granite is actually indeed such a granite. It was formed during a subduction episode during a mountain building event hundreds of millions of years ago in Antarctica, during a period of first subduction and then continental collision, which is very different from the current tectonic setting of Antarctica. The current tectonic setting of Antarctica is a passive margin. It's a passive margin miles and miles away from a spreading center out in the ocean. So Antarctica's ge geology has changed a lot over the years, but we still have some clues as to ancient geology that we can use. Igneous rocks are also useful because they contain minerals that can be studied, that can be that can be used to obtain an absolute date. Now, rocks can be broken down into sediment. Um, and that sediment, like sand or silt or pebbles or even chemical products like ions that are dissolved off from rocks, they will eventually be consolidated into rocks under pressure. And that is how we form sedimentary rocks. And sedimentary rocks include this sandstone that is visible in this layer um, in my field area, actually, in one of the, um, in the Taylor Valley. And this formed from, this formed as a marine rock originally in a beach-like environment, but it has since been compressed and uplifted into mountains. And 
we've also found fossils in sandstone and in shale, which is a rock that comes from mud, in Antarctica. Fossils usually are actually found in rocks that were formed from sediment because oftentimes you get fossils when an animal or a piece of a plant falls into a lake or into the ocean and gets buried in sand and mud and then their remnants get preserved fairly well and they are included in these rocks that form from the sand or from the mud. You don't get fossils in igneous rocks very often. Why? Well, igneous rocks are hot. If an animal were in, if an animal or its, rem or its remains were in contact with an igneous rock, it would basically be melted into oblivion. Sometimes you do get fossils preserved from ash falling on them, but that's a fairly rare example. Now, it's actually hard to obtain an absolute date on, um, on a sedimentary rock, like the beacon sandstone. That's because since the individual pieces in it, the bits of sand are broken off from many different sources, it's hard to tell which ones came from which. As we'll find out, we often actually use strategically the location of igneous rock units to constrain the age of sedimentary rocks. And here, actually, you have this dolom uh, it's this dolerite sill, which is an igneous rock. You don't know what a dol you probably don't know what dolerite or a sill is, but these are igneous rocks, and we can date those more easily and get a formation date on when the sandstones were put in place. And I'll go into that on the next slide. Now, metamorphic rocks form when either sedimentary rocks, igneous rocks, or even other metamorphic rocks are drastically changed by heat and pressure, such that they form new minerals and their texture changes. And they often have a warped appearance. A good example is this gneiss, and this gneiss formed as a result of seafloor sediments being compressed during a mountain building episode, and these are all over my field area, gneisses and schists, as well as rocks like this calc silicate, which formed when limestone, a sedimentary rock made from extinct organisms, extinct marine organisms, came into contact with lava and that created lots of pretty green and red minerals. It created new minerals. And you don't often find fossils in metamorphic rocks. Metamorphic rocks um, are actually often hard to study and the oldest rocks on earth often end up becoming metamorphosed because most metamorphic rocks form from high heat and pressure when they're buried. Calc silicates are actually one exception to that. And the oldest rocks on earth are buried quite deeply and tend to metamorphose. So that tends to actually often destroy fossils from ancient times, or at least make them very hard to detect. But anyway, this is a good slide to return to before you do lab four, which will be rocks of Antarctica. Now, how do we find out the age of rocks? This is actually a picture from uh, a national park where I worked, John Day Fossil Beds, and it's famous for its record of mammal fossils. So rocks from the Cenozoic era, younger than the dinosaur age. And it's a good example of how we can use two methods together. Absolute dates, which are us saying this rock is 32 million years, give or take, give or take half a million years, because we always have to include an error estimate, or this rock is 35 million years. It's being able to come up with a number for how old a rock is. And we obtain this by using radioactive dating. We obtain this by studying the radioactive decay of radioactive elements that are in the minerals contained within these igneous rocks. It's not as easy to do that for sedimentary rocks like these sandstones and claystones here because they're made of broken up pieces of other rocks. Other rocks break down into sediment and then get compressed into sedimentary rocks. It's very hard to figure out the exact age that the sedimentary rock formed because if we are lucky enough and obtain an age on just one crystal in it, that doesn't necessarily tell us when the rock formed. That, tell, that tells us when the rock that broke down into one of the sediment clasts actually formed. So a lava flow or a fall of ash can be analyzed for an absolute date, but sand or clay cannot be done so as easily. Now, in the example above though, we actually have igneous rocks above sedimentary rocks, and we also have igneous rocks below sedimentary rocks. And as you might guess, the younger down a rock is, that, um, excuse me, the, the lower down a rock is, the older it's going to be, almost always. And so we can pretty easily guess that the oldest rock in the sequence is going to be this 35 million year old ash layer, and that the youngest rock is going to be this lava flow on top, and that these sediments are somewhere in the middle. So these sediments we actually have a pretty good constraint for. We know that they're somewhere between 32 and 35 million years old, which in terms of paleontology is actually a pretty 
good window of time. That's actually pretty, that's about as well constrained as you, constrained as you can get much of the time. And these clays and sands have fossils in them. So we're then able to say these fossils belong to animals that lived sometime between 32 and 35 million years. And so this is why it's important, this is why it's often important for us to use both methods of dating together because we need sedimentary rocks to find fossils. We don't really find fossils in igneous rocks so much. And igneous rocks help us figure out exactly how old the fossils are. Now, absolute ages come from radioactivity. The assumption that we have to make is that we have a mineral that crystallizes as the magma is cooling into a solid rock and that those crystals settle and cool about at the same time as the rock as a whole does. We're assuming that everything cooled quickly and that the cooling age for the mineral represents the cooling age for the rock. That's often a good assumption, but we have to be careful with that. And it also turns out that we are assuming that the mineral has not had any chemical interference of any sort since it formed. And of course, that's often a good assumption, but it's hard to fully test that sometimes. And that's one reason why it's important that we use rock samples that have not been heavily chemically altered. And so we take a mineral of interest like zircon, which is actually the mineral that I worked with for my Antarctic rocks. And we take a mineral that has a radioactive isotope in it. We take a mineral that takes in something like uranium that radioactively decays to lead. And one, what we end up doing is we measure the amount of uranium relative to the amount of lead because we know the rate at which an individual radioactive isotope like uranium-238, we know the rate that that decays to lead. And the ideal mineral to use is one that takes in the parent isotope, the radioactive isotope, and that doesn't normally take in the daughter isotope, which is the not radioactive product of the radioactive breakdown. And we have to take, we have to find a rock that has a lot of individual crystals of a mineral that we can do this with, like zircon. And so it ends up involving a long and rather expensive process of separating the minerals from the rock. We have to saw the rock to we have to saw the rock open to get a right sized piece. We have to crush the rock using this wonderful jaw crusher machine. We have to use this gold table to separate the zircon, which is heavier than the rest of the rock from the rest of the rock. And we have to use magnetic separation. We have to use separation by toxic heavy liquids. And then we have to physically stare into a microscope and pick the zircon minerals and mount them all so that we can blast them with lasers and use what's called a mass spectrometer, which is a machine that is sensitive enough to detect the weight of different atoms. And so it can actually measure how much uranium there is versus how much lead, as well as how much there are of different trace elements like rubidium and strontium or calcium relative to one another. And in short, what we're looking for is we're looking, we're looking for the system of, we're, lo we're looking for the relative amounts of the radioactive element, as well as how much of the decay product there is left. Because the idea is that as more time passes, more of the starting radioactive element will have broken down to the decay product. And so if there's a lot more of the decay product left and not very much of the starting radioactive isotope, then that means that mineral is older. And this is also basically how we've come up with the age of the earth. We've come up with the age of the earth by taking the, by looking at the amounts of radioactive isotopes and their non-radioactive decay products in minerals in ancient rocks. It is very time consuming and expensive to do this, both in terms of the fact that the equipment used is very expensive to run and the process of isolating and separating the minerals is time consuming. So we do end up needing to use relative dating we end up needing to come up with some rules for how we study different layers of rocks relative to another.
And for relative dating, we aren't coming up with a number that says, for example, this black layer is 25 million years old. Rather, we can make claims like this black layer is lower down than this white layer on the top of the ridge. Therefore, the white layer on top of the ridge must be younger. So for sedimentary rocks, we usually assume that the sediments that formed them were deposited flat, that the sand or mud settled into a basin like the bottom of a slow moving river or a lake or the valley floor of a desert or an ocean basin. And that was where they lithified into solid rock. Because if you think about it, if you have sand or mud, it's not going to stop if it's rolling down a hill. If, it's, if, it's, if, if, the, if sand is moving down a hillside, it's not going to stop where it's still sloped. It's going to stop where gravity isn't going to carry it down anymore. The consequence is that if we do find layers of sediment that are warped or curved, we assume that that happened after the rocks were formed. We also assume, again, that the oldest rocks are on the bottom and that the youngest rocks are on the top. It is possible to prove that rocks have been overturned, but you need very good evidence to do so. Unless you have explicit evidence that makes you think that the rocks have been overturned in the form of, in the form of river structures possibly, then the rocks go oldest on bottom to youngest on top. We also assume that sediments were deposited over a continuous area, that the sediments were deposited in a fairly wide area and that if there's a river or canyon that cuts through the beds now so that like you have in the Grand Canyon you see the same sequence of rocks on one side of the river and then the exact same sequence of rocks on the other side of the river that means that the river formed afterward and I'll have an example showing that in a few slides. Lastly if something cuts across something else like if an igneous rock body cuts through layers of sedimentary rocks or if a fault from earthquakes cuts across them then you have the rule of cross-cutting. If a feature cuts across something else, that feature is younger. And we can apply that here to this example of igneous rocks from Antarctica. We have granite, and then we have these two dikes made of different, different, um, different other igneous magma. All three of these are igneous, actually, so we could obtain absolute dates from all three of those. But we can also do some relative dating. If you want to guess what, if you want to figure out which one is older, you want to look at which one that which one is cut through by everything else, because just as the features that do the cutting across are younger, the feature that is cut through by some other feature is going to be the older one. The rock in the background is granite, and the granite is crisscrossed by these black dikes, and it's also crisscrossed by this one pink dike here. Now, between the pink dike and the black dikes, you can figure out that the pink dike is younger because it actually disrupts the black dike as well. It cuts through both the granite and the black dikes. And this is something that we would actually then confirm by using absolute dating. We would see if there is a measurable, if there is a measurable difference in the date between the intrusion of these, um, of these black magmas and the intrusion of these pink magmas. And you can also see how some of these laws work in this example. You can see, for example, that the granite is younger than the deposition of the Brooklyn Formation because it intrudes it. You can also guess that the granite was intruded before a period of erosion because the granite is just cut off here. The granite wouldn't just be cut off here if there hadn't been some erosion since then. The granite doesn't really just stop like that. Igneous rocks, like lava flows or like the blobs of underground magma, kind of just tend to go where they can. They flow over the ground or they flow into cracks. They don't tend to make, they don't tend to just get cut off nicely like this. This means that this was exposed at the surface and eroded away, and that subsequently more deposition started. You can see that the dike is actually younger than both the granite and the Larsenton formation because it cuts through the granite, it cuts through the rocks that the granite itself cuts through, and it cuts through the Larsenton. But it itself stops on the boundary between the Larsenton and the Foster City. And that tells you that there was some erosion between the Larsenton and the Foster City, and that the Foster City formation must be younger than the dike. And you can also see that a lot of these layers used to be continuous. These represent areas, these represent beds of sediment that were deposited 
over the same area. But there's been a river that has cut through this since then. Rivers cut down through rocks, and that's actually how the Grand Canyon formed and why you have the same patterns of rocks on either side of the Grand Canyon, because these layers of sediment were originally pretty darn continuous, but they've since been separated by the river. Now, why do we, one reason why we look at all of this is to find evidence of ancient life. And that goes both ways because we both look at these rocks to find evidence of ancient life. And it turns out we also use fossils to help us determine the difference between different rock units or to determine what sort of environment that a rock formed in. And fossils represent often creatures that were only alive for a very short period of time. We can use the presence of a fossil or the absence of a fossil to decide whether, say, one sandstone is equivalent to another sandstone. And this is really important because remember that when we were talking about continental drift, some of the evidence was that you would have rocks that looked very similar to other rocks, but separated by an ocean. And part of how they confirmed this was finding the same fossils in the same rocks. And although some of the examples I mentioned were a bit more dramatic examples like large mammal ancestors or swimming reptiles, a lot of the time it's the little fossils that help you do this best little fossils like leaves and clams that commonly fossilize and that we can trace the evolution of throughout time. We can, we can find enough fossils of clams that we can pretty easily tell how clams have evolved over time. And so that can actually help us determine whether, say, a sandstone is from the Jurassic period or the Cretaceous period, because the Jurassic period is older than the Cretaceous. And so you would expect to see older or more primitive varieties of clams in there, just to use a basic example. And paleontology is the study. Paleontology is the study of ancient life and evolution, and in particular, how past life relates to modern life. So for example, in the John Day fossil beds example earlier, they were studying those mammals to study how modern mammals evolved. And the interesting thing about a fossil is that a fossil is any evidence of an extinct organism. It's not just a skeleton or bone, even though those are some of the most common, well, actually not the most common fossils, but some of the most spectacular. And you can either have evidence of the organism itself, a body fossil, or you can have evidence that there was an organism there, which is called a trace fossil. So fossils, body fossils are usually going to be the hard mineralized parts of organisms like shells, bones, and teeth, as well as, as, well as wood in the case of plants. Um, and teeth are often the most important markers for dinosaurs and mammals because they are often found in better shape than the whole skeletons and they can be used to track the evolution of say rodents throughout time. Sometimes though organisms are fossilized as impressions um, like footprints or when a leaf impression is visible in mud or we have preserved structures like burrows and nests or these stromatolites, which I'll talk a little bit more in the second half of this lecture. But it's very unlikely that most organisms are actually going to become fossils. We know about a small percentage of the amount of life that actually existed in the past. For one thing, we struggle a lot with understanding the evolution of organisms that don't really have hard parts. Something like fungi, mushrooms, or earthworms don't have hard shells or wood or teeth or skeletons. And so we very rarely find fossils of them and our understanding of how they got to be the way they are now is pretty limited. It's also hard if we're studying microorganisms. We often don't find fossils of, we very rarely find fossils of microbiotic organisms. We have some big exceptions to that, but they're still the exceptions. And even for those animals that do have teeth, bones, and shells, the animal may completely decay before it's buried because bone, our bones and teeth do get broken down by microorganisms. It's also possible that fossils in rocks will be destroyed when those rocks get eroded or when those sedimentary rocks get turned into metamorphic rocks like the gneiss and the calc silicate that you saw earlier. But when an, an, when an animal or a plant dies, its best chance to be fossilized is to be buried by sediment before the skeleton or whatever is left of it can be destroyed by decomposition or before it can be scattered by predators or by natural forces like flooding or wind. We actually do have a lot of fossil deposits from floods or other rapid events where a bunch of animals were buried all at once. And 
those fossils are often really jumbled up, but they end up being preserved very well because there's so much mud covering all of them. And we can look at the rocks that, are, that the fossil is found in, and we can then make an educated guess about the environment that the sediments were deposited in by comparing them to modern rocks. And that tells us what sort of environment the organism lived in, or vice versa, actually. Because some types of rocks, like sandstone, can form both on land in desert environments or in the ocean and beach environments. And if we find clams in the sandstone, that tells us it was probably a marine sandstone. And the fossil record thus comes from our fairly limited understanding with the fossils that we do have. And again, the fossil record is only a fraction of the actual diversity of life that has existed on Earth over geologic time. It's really just what we have and what we're able to find. And we are often forced to say the fossil record is poor in regards to Precambrian time, or the fossil record is poor in terms of amphibians, or the fossil record is poor in terms of fungi. And often our, ham our understanding is hampered by the fact that we simply don't have rocks from that period, or we don't have many left or we have them in some parts of the world, but not others, and so our record is incomplete. The two types of fossils that we have are body fossils and trace fossils, and I briefly mentioned them. If a fossil is part of the body of the organism itself, whether it's a tree leaf, a tooth, or a bone, it's a body fossil, and those can sometimes be impressions. An impression is actually just one way in which a fossil was formed, and an impression can actually be a body fossil if it shows an actual part of the organism, like this leaf. A trace fossil, in contrast, refers to a fossil that shows that an organism was there doing something, like leaving footprints behind or building a burrow, but it doesn't show any part of the organism itself. And in some cases, we only have trace fossils. We have burrows of organisms that we've never found and trackways of dinosaurs that we've never found the bones of. But when we find shells and teeth and mummies or other skeletons, then we have body fossils. Most, um, a lot of the time for vertebrates, for animals like us and dinosaurs and other mammals and birds that have skeletons, the bones are made of apatite, which is a calcium phosphate. So it's actually a mineral and that helps the, and that helps that helps the bones survive longer than other parts. A lot of what happens actually is that the starting appetite will be replaced by a secondary growth of mineral in the shape of the original bone or shell, whether it's by pyrite or by calcite or by more appetite. Now, often um, shells are going to be made of calcium carbonate, and that's something that will come up again when we talk about global warming in regards to the carbon cycle and how the excess acidification of the ocean by the introduction of CO2 has actually caused complications for organisms that build their shells out of calcium carbonate. Now, trace fossils tell us about behavior as opposed to the organism actually being there. So the footprints tell us that dinosaurs were walking here. The stromatolites tell us that microorganisms were building structures here. They were building structures out of sand, even though we don't have any remnant of the bacteria that did this left. Or we have something like burrows or fossil poop. And fossil poop, as gross as it is, is often very useful because it can give us hints as to what ancient animals ate. And I, I mentioned before that, say, if we have clams in a sandstone, that tells us the sandstone was likely a marine sandstone. And fossils do indeed help us determine where sedimentary rocks were formed. And we can use fossils to figure out the depositional environment. The depositional environment tells us in what kind of place the sediments that eventually turned into the sedimentary rock were formed, whether they were formed in a nearshore marine environment like a beach, or if we have leaf impressions that tells us that we're likely, we're likely on land or we're in a forest lake where, leaf, where leaf, leaves are going to fall into. Um, if we have petrified wood, if we have that really pretty rock that comes from wood fossils being, being converted into stone, that tells us that we had a forest there. If we have something like these trilobites, which you might have seen if you've looked at paintings of ancient life, that tells us that we have deep marine because these, pro these 
seem to have lived on the ocean floor. And we sometimes have to be careful with this because we are often assuming that we know where these animals would have lived or these animals or plants would have lived. And that assumption works fairly well if the extinct fossil organism has living relatives that we can compare it to, but that's not always possible. We have close, we have relatives of trilobites still alive. They're related to crabs and other marine arthropods, but they themselves are extinct. So we're making a bit of an educated guess as to where exactly they lived. But in short, one thing you have to consider is that where the rocks are now doesn't have to do anything with where they were deposited. There are sedimentary rocks in Antarctica that were formed underwater and that have marine fossils in them, or that have carbonate in them, that have limestone in them. And you usually get a lot of limestone in places where you have corals growing, and corals tend to live in warm, shallow water. As you might have guessed, Antarctica is not warm at all anymore. Antarctica is not the kind of place where you would still find coral reefs, but we have fossils of coral reefs from Antarctica. And we're going to start learning a little bit more about the fossil history of Antarctica in the next half of the lecture. So I will see you for that.